feel some freedom coming up here. <laughs> I get stories that I'm not quite finished, so can't be shared with you, but let me assure you that people in this community are demonstrating financial freedom, paying off debts that they didn't have any idea how they were gonna be able to pay them off, and yet things have happened seemingly out of the blue to transpire to support this treatment. So do not just say it lightly, take it in, because somebody's financial freedom is looking for them, and it might as well be you. Reach out and grab it. Take a deep breath. We're going to do our treatment together in the lab. I speak my word for myself, my center, and all its members and friends. I know love as the only reality. I am created out of love. Love is what I am. I know this love as absolute freedom in every area of my life, the life of my center and all who call it home. I know our center's mortgages are paid in full, and I claim for all of us financial freedom with all debts paid and cleared. I release any sense of struggle or wrongdoing. I live in an abundant universe where there is more than enough for all. We experience freedom in every moment by always having more than enough money, vibrant health, and loving relationships. We are who we have come here to be. With hearts open wide, we see the world through the eyes of love. We are blessed. We are rich. And we are free, and so it is. And we use our points of power. I always pay attention. I always tell the truth and tell it quickly. I always ask for what I want when I want it. I always take total responsibility for my experience, and I always keep my agreements. And so it is. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Just a quick check-in. Is it hot in here? Yeah. No. no, good, okay, it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been at the beach for uh, the good part of, of two weeks. We came back last week to be with you and uh, to uh, celebrate our wonderful Dorothy Leahy. And I've been rereading the book called the Ernest Holmes Papers. It's actually three books, and what I have are three hardback books. Now it's in one uh, soft paperback. But I'm just, I'm just marveling at how Ernest Holmes took the science of mind from the, the 1918 first edition of his book, Creative Mind, through Creative Mind and Success, and then he came out with the original textbook in 1926. These are transcripts of talks that he did, I think, in the three years prior to his transition. So they're about 1957, 1958, 1960, when he would invite a small group of people into his home, and he would sit there and he would talk to them. And they're not highly organized thoughts. Those of you who, like I, are a fan of the, the logic that he brings forth, the logical argument that we are spirit in form, all of us are, that all is well in the world, that we are powerful, creative, spiritual beings living in a spiritual universe governed by spiritual law, and this is how that works. I love that. These are not them. <laughs> <laughs> this is Ernest the Mystic. Ernest who... <coughs> saw beyond the veil, who spent time not thinking about spiritual principle, not teaching spiritual principle, but hanging out with spirit. And there's a difference. And so I'm reminded of the reason that this was practitioner two, uh, practitioner one material is that it's much deeper than, than basic ideas of science of mind or you can create money and you can cure this illness and you can have your life the way you want it, rah, rah, rah. This is different in that 
instead of trying to manipulate outside circumstances, what we do is we come into alignment with the perfection that already exists. And part of that has to do with our ego, because I know that personally, I like to manipulate outside circumstances. I'll sit there and go, wait a minute, I'm Barbara Waterhouse. I will have a parking space at the front of Sam's. I don't care if it's four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. I know that I, well, thank you very much. And there I go right where there used to be handicapped and now I have them moved for me. Now it's just my <laughs> parking space, I love to do that. But that's not the end all be all of this teaching. That's baby steps. Is my microphone going in and out? Yes. yes. Let me just have this one, Kristen. I, I don't know, I don't know. It's me. I'm sure it's me. Let's forget it. I'm, I'm zapping the mics. <laughs> but those are baby steps in metaphysics, especially in science of mind. And so we go back to the original concept, which is oneness, which is not new. There have been people talking about oneness all along, as above, so below. Mind is matter in form. Form is, matter in, is mind in solution. There have been people who have been talking about this idea of oneness for thousands and thousands of years, that there's only one thing going on. But what in the world does that mean when I say there's only one? What does that mean to you? What does that mean to me? What does it mean when we take it as far as we can go? It means that there is not only a power and a presence that is each and every one of us. It means not only that the entire universe is created out of God's stuff, but it means that the entire, now take a deep breath because this is, this is big. It means that the entirety of God is present at the point of you now. Well, you can't say that. I saw somebody, uh, one of our ministers, uh, uh, just this morning, I was fooling around on YouTube while I was getting ready, say, well, we aren't all of God. Yes, we are. We must be all of God in order for us to be at all. For a unity to exist, it must exist in its totality at every point simultaneously. That means that all of God must exist at the point of you. You are not an individual God. Like Wallace Waddles said, we are all gods. No, we're not. We are a point of the divine. We are an individualization of spirit, and that's different. We are not, I'm a part of God, Margo's a part of God, someone else is a part of God. No, that's not the way it is, because then we've moved from oneness into two-ness. My part and your part, they're separate. And you know, there's a lot of safety in two-ness, because if there's two-ness, then there's something that can give it to me. Yay, I'm good, maybe I'll get it. Something that can take it away from me. I couldn't help it, they took it away from me. But when there is oneness, it is all at the point of us. All at the point of us, and that is so big. And that is what that is what some people have so much trouble with. And I know I've had many, many people get mad and leave. And some of them do it quietly, and some of them do it quite vocally at me, <laughs> saying that these things that I say are not reasonable, that I ask too much of people, that how in the world can they be creating things that they don't have anything to do with? Everything is a reflection of your consciousness. Everything in your world is a reflection of your consciousness. It must be. There's nothing outside of you. There is only the oneness moving through you. And even what you see in your world is very much your choice. You know, some of us see certain things in life, like, oh my gosh, it's politics, and, and they have one reaction, and then someone else has a completely different reaction. So not only is it the manifestation, but it's the response to it. Everything is you. One of the things that Ernest says that just blew me away is that the mountain will be to you what you are to the mountain. The mountain will be to you what you are to the mountain. 
The mountain is not separate from you. The mountain is to you what you are to the mountain. Some people see these mountains, some people move here to the mountains. Some people right now are off hiking the mountains because they are experiencing the mountain as this wonderful connection with nature. That that is their church, that is their spiritual experience. That the mountain is fantastic. Some people photograph the mountains. Some people find waterfalls in the mountains. Some people drive the mountains and they're wonderful. Other people look at the mountains differently. My son is a geotechnical engineer. He looks at the mountain as to how he can cut out part of it and make it flat and prop up the rest of it so it doesn't fall over. That's what he does. He sees the mountain as something that may be getting in the way of his building. And it needs to be shifted. The mountain is to us what we are to the mountain. Deep breath. <coughs> How about your partner is to you what you are to your partner? Ah, oh, well, that's, oh, that's ridiculous. I've had partners that were dirty, rotten, racking fratchets. Well, guess what? I was the dirty, rotten, racking fratchet. Well, I've had people in my life who have lied to me. Well, guess what? I was the liar. If there's only oneness, Everything in our world can only be that which we bring to our world. If there is only oneness, then whatever it is we are getting is what we have given. Wow. And this is not a punitive kind of a thing. Because if there is only oneness, then the spark of the divine is in each and every one of us. The apple is in the seed before the seed is ever planted. The spark of spirit is within us before we ever look around and go, who am I and what's going on? If there is only oneness, then the light and the love of God itself is already us. We don't have to turn into it. We don't have to go buy it. We don't have to negotiate for it. We don't have to change in any way, shape, or form. It is not that we are trying to manipulate circumstances in our lives. We are coming into alignment with that which already is. The solution is already in the problem. The healing is already in the illness. That's why we say there's nothing to heal, only truth to be revealed. There's nothing to heal because there's nothing wrong. There is only that state of perfection. But I'll grant you, we come into this teaching, and it's like, Barbara, please, I've been diagnosed with this and that. Please treat, have the practitioners treat, make it go away. And for the most part, we do. But that's only the beginning. Learning how to demonstrate money, learning how to have things in life is only so I can either get your attention or have you stop wasting your attention on things that don't matter so that we can focus on what really does matter, which is not manipulating the circumstances in our lives because then if I have me and my circumstances over here, I've lost my oneness, I have two-ness. I'm living in a world of duality, a world where I use the power of affirmation and spiritual mind treatment and mental thought to shift those outside, far away from me things. That's not how it works. I come into alignment with the spark of God inside of me. I come into alignment with the love that I always have been. And then the circumstances fall into place, but I am not micromanaging them. Sometimes they fall into place in a really different way than I thought they would. When I'm involved with my ego, saying this is the way I want it to be, then I'm in a dualistic world. I'm lost. And I'm trusting what, my ego to figure this out? That hasn't worked out so well in years gone by. But when I can trust that there is something within me, there is a power and a presence within me, and nothing is wrong, circumstances shift seemingly miraculously. That's why when we move into the idea of a practitioner consciousness, it's not the world of effect. It is not the world of micromanaging conditions, 
Although practitioners will be asked to do that over and over and over and over again. Please treat for me for this. Please treat for me for that. Please bring this into my life. Please make this go away as if I don't have anything to do with the circumstances. That's ridiculous. But when I stop seeing the circumstances outside of me as defining who I am, and I turn within and I find that space within me that is already perfect, whole, and complete, then first of all, I don't really care about the circumstances outside of me. And secondly, the circumstances outside of me shift because they don't define who I am. They don't give me my sense of well-being. That's who I am. That's where I come from originally. We're not missing anything. We haven't done anything wrong. There is no mistake. Take that one in. You've never made a mistake. You've never done anything wrong because there is no mistake and no wrong. And this whole idea that people have put together about spirituality and religion and God and heaven and hell and devils and all of that, that's crazy stuff. When we completely forgive ourselves, when we completely stop blaming ourselves, we will stop blaming everyone else. We will forgive everyone else. If you have someone in your life that you're blaming, it's just because you're blaming yourself. And the truth is, is that you are perfect, whole, and complete, pure spirit. You didn't do anything wrong. You did what you did, and that's what it is. That's this experience called life. If there is anything on the outside, it comes from within. And so I watch these political things. And I've gotten to where I just laugh because we did that. Our unhealed stuff has coalesced into two pinpoints, well, four if you look at the, uh, everybody on the slate, but they coalesced into these two major points of unhealed, unforgiving, blaming, attacking, fighting energies. And for me, that's just showing how we are ready to heal. We are ready as a country to heal. We are ready individually to heal. When I stopped getting mad at the debates, I knew I was on to something. <laughs> when I said, wow, that's me. I've done that. Wow, that's me. I've done that. I have. I've done that. I've done all that stuff. <coughs> and when I let myself be okay with that, I don't choose to do those things anymore, then I don't have to get upset with anyone else. Then I don't have to waste my time pointing a finger at someone else living in the delusion that anybody has say over me. Nobody has say over me. Nobody has say over you. Once again, it does not matter who is in the White House. It matters who is in your house. Amen. Your house. So the first thing to do is to look at whatever may keep you from hanging out in bliss. The entire universe comes together to support you because it is you. Love loves as you. That's it. Love's got nobody else but you. So all of love loves as you. All of life lives as you. And when you can move away from this idea that Troer called secondary causation, which is when I get that, I will be or I will have. No, nothing is the boss of you. Nothing determines your welfare. It's you and God and that's it. It's not even you and God. It's God as you. And that's it. That's all that's going on. So I love how Ernest went from the logical argument of this is the way the universe works, this is who you are, this is how spiritual law works, and this is how you can use it, complete with diagrams and circles and V's and all of these words, to saying there is only one, and the implications of that are total, because the one is infinite. Nothing outside of it 
It is absolute, nothing in relation to it, that it is one as you. You're not one with God. You are of God. God is of you. And when you open up to that, I tell you, the power dwarfs anything that you might ever have created by affirmations and treatments and focusing on this particular thing. There is no thing. And yet, in the no thing is all thing. So you want it all? You go to the place where there's only that which is beyond thing. You open up to the presence of spirit fully and completely as you. You let go of any and all sense that it's got to be a certain way. And just know that all is well. And they will tell you that miracles have happened in your body, in your finances, in your business, in your marriage, in your relationship. Because life truly is a miracle. And when we stop trying to manipulate it and just jump in, and say, this is what I am, then we get it all. And so it is.